And we're live. All right. Um, I'm Ryan May with Jay Rieger and Company. Uh, welcome to the first episode of Barely Enough. Uh, we are live, and uh, we're going to talk about cocktails. Actually, this show is going to be um, hopefully more than one episode. We'll see how this goes. Um, but it's going to be kind of a, not an instructional type thing where I'm showing you necessarily how to make drinks, but I kind of wanted to embody the idea of what it feels like to sit at the bar, to sit at someone's bar and have cocktails. Maybe you talk about the ingredients, maybe you talk about something else. But I think one of the most fun things about uh, bartending and about cocktails especially are, are the stories behind them. There's always a, an origin story. Sometimes it's a little bit made up, sometimes it's funny. Um, but I think that's kind of part of the magic that goes into sitting at a bar and having a cocktail is that sort of banter and interaction with the bartender and, and you take away something a little bit more than just a drink itself. Uh, so today on this episode we're just going to dive into like three classic cocktails and I'm going to make them and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about where they come from, how they originated, and we'll, we'll see where this goes. Um, first one, um, we couldn't do this without starting with the horse feather. The horse feather is an iconic, uh, ubiquitous cocktail from Kansas City that has always been a part of the Jay Rieger uh, story and the Jay Rieger uh, brand right now. We've connected it with our Kansas City whiskey, and it's by far the most recognizable cocktail that we uh, that we make with uh, our Kansas City whiskey is the horse feather. It's sort of uh, our signature serve. So uh, what I love about this drink are a lot of things, but it's super easy to make first off. Um, what's cool about it is a lot of times if you're not a big whiskey drinker or if you think you don't like whiskey, it's because you always associate it with something like an old fashioned or maybe a Manhattan, which tend to be boozy, stirred, uh, strong drinks that kind of have a bitter sweetness. Well, this is just the opposite of that. This is refreshing and light and kind of spicy sweet at the same time, um, but it's really simple to make. Anyone can make it. You can make it at home, you can order in a dive bar. It doesn't really matter. You don't even have to measure. I usually like to measure, but I'm not gonna measure on this one. Um, so with a horse feather, you're just gonna make a highball. You're gonna use our Rieger's Kansas City whiskey. Ounce and a half. I'm gonna go a little bit heavier because that's just what I like to do. Um, and then ginger beer. So this is like a whiskey, like a whiskey ginger. Uh, you'll also notice I kind of like to start with pouring the ingredients in the glass first. It lets them mix together a little bit more. When you build a highball over ice, sometimes they don't integrate all that well. Um, so I kind of like to get it started uh, just like that without ice, then add the ice and top it off. Notice it's nice and fizzy, nice and light. Refreshing, really, really simple to make. And then here's sort of the, the signature behind a true Kansas City horse feather, um, or actually Lawrence, I'll get to that in a second, um, is the, the Angostura bitters. It has the addition of Angostura bitters, so it's not just a whiskey ginger. Please don't refer to it as a mule. Um, that's a whole other thing we can go down. Uh, but it's a, there's a significant amount of Angostura bitters, and the way that we like to make this is just kind of putting it right on top. Um, I usually say three to four dashes, but frankly, I make, um, I love Angostura bitters, and so we'll put a little bit more uh, than that on top, and you'll notice the, the color differ differentiation there. Um, it's really, really nice, and it's kind of a visual um, element to an otherwise pretty simple drink. And then finally, we're gonna add a lemon wedge. Right on top, we're gonna cut that right. And voila, that's it. That's a horse feather. Now, there are a couple things that I said in there about the horse feather that uh, some of you might get mad at me about. So the, the horse feather didn't necessarily, necessarily originate in Kansas City. Um, it's actually a drink from Lawrence, Kansas that as far as I can tell, originated in the early 1990s, like roughly 1991. Um, at a bar called the East Street Taproom, which is still open in existence today. Um, that's where this drink really took off and became really, really popular. Also of note, it was made back then with Old Overholt rye whiskey, uh, which is fascinating in itself because at that time, in the early 1990s, rye whiskey was practically non-existent in the United States. It was pretty much a dead category and there just wasn't much of it around at all, but from what I've been able to hear from people that were around back then that were making this drink at that bar at that time, they were going through a lot of old overholt rye. They were also 
in a time long before the whole craft cocktail movement came back, they were making their own homemade ginger beer, which I think is really, really cool. And if you have the ability to do that, you can really adjust the spiciness to your liking, but typically, because you're using fresh uh, ginger juice, it's gonna be really, really pungent, really, really spicy and upfront. Um, so think, I wish I had been around to go drinking in Lawrence, Kansas back in the early 1990s, because I think it would have been really cool to have an original horse feather back then. Later on, it eventually became so popular that it moved over to Kansas City, uh, became popular at some big time bars like Harry's Bar and Tables in the mid 90s. And the first time that I can see the horse feather originating in a, a published work was in Gaz Riggins' Bartender's Bible around 1996, uh, where he actually credited Harry's Bar and Tables with the invention of it. Um, after talking with Gaz about this many years ago, um, I went and spoke with the, the team at Harry's who said, no, we didn't invent it. And so that kind of led me down that rabbit hole to the origin in Lawrence. But the cool thing is that it might even date back further than that. Um, digging into the history of it, you look at the name, think about the name horse feather, think about the ingredients and the style of drink just being a spirit uh, forward highball, um, you could lump it into that mule category, right? But the original um, mule was more or less a riff on a horse's neck, which dates back to the early, early 1900s, maybe even late 1800s, and it was a non-alcoholic drink. It was just ginger beer with bitters and lemon, um, and that was it. It later morphed into an alcoholic version in the 1950s, but by that point, mainly it was blended whiskey that was most popular. And so by the time it became popular in uh, Lawrence in the 1990s, the fact that we're using uh, straight rye is really, really cool. But Gaz Regan knew that not everybody could get straight rye, and so he actually published in his recipe to use straight rye or blended whiskey, um, which is really interesting. So today, it's fun to kind of compare our version with Kansas City whiskey next to a version with Old Overholt because it does make a difference when you use those uh, different whiskeys. Um, and there's even a recipe older than the horse's neck dating all the way back to 1898 in Kansas City. It was published in the KC Star um, called the Bradley Martin Highball. And it was actually rye whiskey, ginger beer, and orange bitters. And there's this whole story about how the bartender crafted it for someone uh, who was a former mil military personnel and uh, it was published in the Kansas City Star. So who knows, somehow that drink, um, the Bradley Martin Highball from 1898 in Kansas City may have made its, all, its way all the way down to Lawrence in the 1990s and then eventually back to Kansas City. And here we are today with the horse feather as our signature serve. Still one of my all time favorite drinks, light, refreshing, uh, got a spicy little kick to it, um, but it's just a fantastic, easy drinking, easy to make uh, whiskey cocktail. Cheers. I'm gonna squeeze a little lemon in it. Questions? We do have a question, right? Excellent. This is from the very beginning. Okay. Why is this series called Barely Enough? Why is this, why is this series called Barely Enough? Um, that's a really good question. So we went through a lot of different iterations of names and we really wanted to do something that was creative and not so obvious like, you know, behind the bar, behind the ball. You see things like that all the time. Um, and I'm a bit of a, a history geek as well as cocktail geek, um, if you haven't noticed. And we ended up uh, sourcing from a quote from another legendary Missourian, Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, um, that too much of anything can be bad for you, but too much good whiskey is barely enough. And we just felt like that was a really appropriate uh, quote from someone who grew up in this area. So it has that kind of historic connection and it's just kind of fun. That's it. All right, cool. So since too much good whiskey is barely enough, let's make another whiskey cocktail. Um, this time we're gonna make the Pendergast, which um, it has a really cool story to it. It has a little bit of background to it. Not as much as reaching back into the 1800s like uh, the one we just did was, but when I was sort of uh, an up and coming bartender, so to speak, or I was young and trying to, trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my own bar and everything, I got really fascinated with classic cocktails. And in reading stories about cocktails and their origin, it was really fun to find out where they came from, who made them, how they got their recipes and all that. And this is before I discovered the history of the horse feather. Um, you know, I noticed all these drinks, a lot of them came from New York, a lot of them originated in New Orleans, 
San Francisco. Keep in mind that the cocktail is an American innovation. It's, it was born here. The actual single serving cocktail uh, was created in the United States in the early 1800s. And that art form and that craft and that profession grew and evolved here and then spread to other parts of the world. Um, and so one day I just asked myself, well, why, why haven't I found a cocktail that originated in Kansas City? And so it sort of inspired me to create my own drink um, that maybe one day could be um, a cocktail known as being from Kansas City. And that's how the Pendergast came about, which fortunately it has sort of spread. It's kind of been used in a lot of bars all over the city and the region, as well as uh, I've even seen it on menus in other countries and all over the US. So um, the fun thing about the, the Pendergast is, um, well, a few things. So it's a simple, easy drink to make, but this one's gonna be boozy and stirred more along the lines of a Manhattan, uh, but the name. You might notice the name Pendergast. This is named after Tom Pendergast, or Boss Tom Pendergast, who was responsible for keeping Kansas City kind of a swinging, happening area uh, during Prohibition. Um, you might have heard the phrase Paris of the Plains. Um, Kansas City became known as Paris of the Plains during that time period uh, because a young reporter named Edward Morrow traveled through Kansas City and was so blown away by the jazz culture and the nightlife and the party atmosphere that he went back and he wrote a story about his visit here and said, if you want to see some sin, forget about Paris and go to Kansas City. Uh, that's how the phrase Paris of the Plains came to be. Um, but it's true, during that time, from 1919 to 1933, 14 years of prohibition, Kansas City was the only major city in the US that didn't have a single felony conviction for the sale and distribution of alcohol. It's kind of cool when you think about it, over 14 years, you had all these major cities in the US that were trying to imbibe, you know, you had the speakeasy culture, speakeasy culture happening, uh, but people were always getting busted, right? In Kansas City, that never happened, and the reason was Boss Tom Pendergast. So the way it would work is everything was kind of wide open back then, um, in KC anyway. There wasn't a whole lot of actual speakeasy culture because bars and clubs just opened uh, their doors and stayed open 24-7 with uh, street-facing windows and doors and signage, and they didn't really care. Because basically, the feds would come into KC at that time, they would bust a speakeasy, uh, arrest a bootlegger, something like that, and make a big showing of it. They'd have the Kansas City Star come out, they'd arrest them in public, have pictures taken, have a story printed, but then they had to immediately hand them over to the local authorities because it was out of their jurisdiction. Now, when they went to court for prosecution, the judges would just drop the charges and let them all go, and they would go right back to work. Reason is that Tom Pendergast actually hold, held more power and sway in this town than the mayor or anyone else. He appointed all of the judges. He even handpicked a lot of the police officers out of Leavenworth Prison um, and put them right onto the police force, so they were all corrupt. And he would make sure that all these guys, you know, when they got busted by the feds, just went right back to work. And so there was never a single felony conviction for the sale and distribution of alcohol uh, in Kansas City during Prohibition, which is kind of kind of interesting, kind of cool. Another fun little sidebar from that is one of the most famous judges that he appointed. He actually took out of um, he had owned a haberdashery at 12th and Baltimore, and uh, this was Harry Truman, uh, our president. And he said, because he knew all the prosecutors, law enforcement, um, he sold all the judges their suits and hats and fancy clothes. Pendergast said, you could, you could do wonders for me in the court system. Handpicked him, made him a circuit court judge. Next thing you know, he's in politics and he's president of the United States. Kind of cool. All right, so this is the Pendergast. KC whiskey, uh, we're using Spanish vermouth, Benedictine, and then two different kinds of bitters, orange bitters and Angus servitors. This is actually the second version of the Pendergast. Since I created this drink back in 2006, uh, 17 years ago, um, obviously J. Rieger & Company wasn't around back then, so I originally made it with bourbon, but once we launched J. Rieger & Co., I wanted to make this drink using our Kansas City whiskey because everybody wanted a Pendergast made with Kansas City whiskey. I'm like, well, Kansas City whiskey's not bourbon, so it's not really a Pendergast. So I'm like, all right, let me tweak it a little bit. 
I switched out the vermouth for Spanish. I had been using an Italian vermouth, and then just changed the bitters up a little bit. The orange bitters really play very nicely with, uh, with the Kansas City whiskey and the sherry that we add into it, and it works out really, really well. So this is technically a Pendergast number two. We're gonna garnish it with a nice long lemon twist. And there you have it. You may also notice uh, that this cocktail, uh, the service style of it, right? Um, I stirred it over ice, got it nice and cold, got it a little bit diluted, um, but instead of serving it straight up in a martini glass, I served it in a rocks glass, but without ice. This is a kind of unknown version of cocktail service known as down, uh, or serving a drink down. Um, the only other drink that I can really think of that's very popular uh, using this technique would be a Sazerac out of uh, New Orleans, which is a wonderful, uh, most amazing uh, classic cocktail. It's actually um, arguably my favorite classic cocktail. I think maybe we'll do one of these episodes just on that cocktail alone, because it's got such a cool story to it. Um, but that's how I wanted to serve this drink. So it's a nice, boozy, strong cocktail, um, but served, in, served down in a rocks glass. It's a sipper, um, but it's lovely. Um, and there you have it. Pendergast number two. We, I think we have a question. We do. You said earlier that cocktail is an American invention. Do we know who invented the cocktail? Oh boy. Um, that's an awesome question. You know, the cool thing about um, cocktail archaeology is that there's a whole bunch of um, mystery around it, right? There's not a whole lot of really great, um, uh, really great. Uh, documentation around this stuff because it all sort of happened organically, right? Also, you didn't have uh, information uh, means back then like we have today. But what we do know is that the original cocktail is actually what we know today as the old fashioned. It was a combination of spirits, sugar, water, and bitters. That was actually originally called a cocktail and that was the name of the drink, and it just spawned this whole category leading to everything else, and then subcategories that spun off from there. So we do know that the original cocktail, the first cocktail ever created, uh, was uh, what we know today as an old-fashioned using uh, spirits, sugar, water, and bitters, and it's probably made using brandy, uh, most likely, uh, even before it became uh, popularized as a whiskey cocktail. All right. Good stuff. I'm gonna have to set that aside and drink the rest of it in a minute. All right, so we're gonna do one more. Um, this one is really fun. And what I love about this next drink is the intersection uh, with hospitality. So, you know, I've, I've been bartending now for about 25 years. And I've always taken a lot of pride in being a bartender. Now, somewhere along my um, career trajectory, I was sort of labeled with uh, the title of mixologist. You might have heard this word before. It's been kind of popularized over the last 15 or so years, and I think I'm maybe part of a reason for that. Um, I definitely grabbed a hold of the whole craft cocktail movement and you know, took a lot of pride in the way that drinks are made, the ingredients used, making homemade ingredients, taking more of a culinary approach uh, to making drinks instead of just slinging them as fast as possible. However, one of the things that I've always said um, is that you can be a really great mixologist and a terrible bartender. But in order to be a great bartender, you have to have the whole package. In order to be a great bartender, you have to know how to make really great drinks, but you have to know so much more than that. That's like 10 or 15% of the total equation. You've gotta be able to read the room, you've gotta be able to watch your staff, you've gotta be able to work with the person next to you, um, you've got to be able to entertain people that want to be entertained and you've got to be able to know when to kind of back off those that just want to be served a cocktail and left alone, right? It's really an art form, it's really a dance, and it's really, um, there's, a, there's a lot of nuance to it. But this cocktail, I think, embodies that in a lot of ways, um, whereas it's a really simple cocktail with a very complex story um, about how it came about and it was inspired by a wonderful historic bartender that cared about nothing more than just giving his guests the best possible experience. So this cocktail um, is called the Flame of Love. And it originated in the 1950s 
um, in Hollywood, California, Hollywood, California, um, by a bartender named Pepe Ruiz. Pepe had a regular customer who came in weekly by the name of Dean Martin, and Dean always drank uh, martinis. Originally, he drank gin martinis, and then he switched over to vodka martinis. Remember, this is the 1950s, and that's right when Smirnoff Vodka started this really, really impactful marketing campaign that popularized vodka throughout the U.S. Um, and they started in Hollywood. They started with famous actors. Um, and so Dean Martin started drinking vodka martinis. The whole idea was it would leave you breathless, right? You could go out to a, a three martini lunch and instead of going back to work and having your boss smell gin on your breath, vodka was odorless. So it would leave you breathless. So he starts drinking vodka martinis, right? Well, one day he's sitting there with Pepe Ruiz and he says, Pepe, I come here all the time. Um, why haven't you made a signature martini that's just mine? It's just the Dean Martin specially signature drink. And Pepe says, okay, let me, let me do something like that. So instead of coming up with something really intricate, he took exactly what he knows that Dean Martin likes. He, he knows what he drinks. He drinks vodka martinis, he likes gin, he likes a little bit more flavor, and he just riffed on it a little bit. He just did something, a little, tweaked it a little bit to make it unique for Dean Martin. But this really was about showmanship more so than the recipe. So what he actually did was he took his glass. This is called a Nick and Nora glass, by the way. Uh, you can also use a coupe or a martini glass. Um, and he took some little orange discs. I think I have a question. Why is that called a Nick and Nora glass? Oh my god, that's, that's a story for another episode. <laughs> That's a, it's a long story, um, but let me finish this one really first, and I think maybe I can get into the Nick and Nora uh, story. But uh, so he started by taking these little orange peels and using a match, flamed them into the glass. And you can see, uh, if you look really carefully, I think you can see it on the, can you see it on the video? The flame? Oh, I lost it. Oh, bummer, okay. Good bartender always has a book of matches. Always, right on him. My flame went out. Unbelievable. A good lesson right here. Um, you'll notice I always have an open flame right on the bar, and I've got some matches in a little shot class here. That way it's easy to reach. You don't have to fumble around in your pocket or ask someone for a lighter, and then you can just one hand pick up a match light it, and you're good to go. Watch the oil, right? Now, in addition to um, the really cool show that they're putting on, the oil from the orange peel is spraying into the glass, creating this really nice aroma, and coating, coating the glass with some orange oil for flavor. And we'll just do one more. All right. Now, we're gonna make the drink. Now, typically in a, a martini, you've got dry vermouth. Pepe took out the dry vermouth and he grabbed a bottle of Fino Sherry. You don't see Fino Sherry used a lot behind the bar anymore, uh, but it used to be a very common and popular ingredient and it's something that I absolutely love. It's wonderful. Try it sometime if you've never had it. It's really, really great. Um, this is a dry sherry. Fino Sherry is really bone dry, um, kind of earthy and acidic. Um, provides a lot of the character and quality uh, like you would in a uh, dry vermouth. And then instead of gin, we're gonna use vodka. In this case, we're doing about a five to one uh, vodka to sherry, which is strong, like really, really, really strong drink. And then finally, a couple dashes of orange bitters to kind of pair with the uh, orange oil. And then finally, what he's gonna do here is he's going to, instead of stirring it or shaking it, he's gonna throw it. So real quick, shaking versus stirring. Simple rule here, shake if you're using sugar, citrus juices, something like that. If you're making a sour, a daiquiri, a margarita, shake, right? You wanna aerate it, integrate those uh, ingredients. If you're using all booze, so I think Manhattan, think Negroni, think Martini, all booze, you don't wanna shake that drink. You don't wanna over, <clears throat> over dilute it and get it aerated, you want it to be silky and smooth. But this is right in the middle. Because we're using something like Fino Sherry, which is kind of big and bold, I need to get a little bit of air into it, so we're gonna throw it. And so this is what he did. He started by just holding, 
one hand out up here to his right and transferring the contents straight down into the other half of the shaker and doing that over and over about five or six times roughly. So this is known as throwing. What you'll notice is that it's getting really, really cold really, really fast. And if you look really carefully, you'll even notice that on my cocktail shaker, it's starting to frost up on the outside. But you're not breaking up the ice like you would be in shaking a cocktail. You're just getting a little bit of aeration, little bit of bubbles, opening up those flavors and aromas, and giving it a slight bit of texture while getting it ice freaking cold. All right, finally, we're gonna pour it into our Nicanora, and we're gonna add one final orange peel. And there you have it. All right, flame of love. So he serves Dean Martin the martini, says, there you are, I call it the flame of love. Dean Martin loves it. I think maybe he loved the, uh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> um, I think he, maybe he loved the name and the, the show, maybe even a little bit better than the drink, but talk about a way to get people's attention. So the very next day, Dean Martin comes back in and he brings his good buddy, Frank Sinatra. They sit down, he's like, Frank, you've gotta have this drink. So he orders up two Flame of Love cocktails, Pepe whips them up, all kinds of showmanship, puts them in front of them. They are blown away. Frank Sinatra says, I wanna buy a round for every person in this restaurant. It's a big restaurant. Lots of people, like 250, 300 people. So Pepe Ruiz gets everything shut down. He asks every server, every busser, every bar back, people out of the kitchen and just starts lining up glasses, lining up orange peels, flaming glasses, mixing them up, throwing them, puts on this whole show, stops everything so that Frank Sinatra can buy a cocktail for every person in the restaurant. And that story became legend. No matter how much it might be, might be embellished, I don't know, it became legend and it became part of the allure and mystique of this cocktail, which I think is really beautiful because it's not just about the ingredients, it's not just about the recipe, but it's about the showmanship. And more than anything else, it's about the hospitality. It's about taking care of your guests, putting on a show and making them want to come back and sit at your bar every single day. So, flame of love. All right, what do we got? Oh, <coughs> Nick and Nora. Um, that, I believe the name for that glass came from um, a film series called The Thin Man in the late 1950s, early uh, 1960s about uh, a couple that were like private investigators, a husband and wife couple, um, that basically they would get these uh, private investigative gigs and then they would just screw it all up and they'd get really wasted uh, from drinking martinis and that was the type of glass uh, that they always drank their martinis out of, and so it became known as a Nick and Nora glass. Um, I'm gonna have to double check that one because I haven't looked up that story in a long time, but I'm pretty sure that w that's where it came from. Another question? We have one last question. Um, speaking of the Rat Pack, you mentioned mm -hmm. Martin, Frank Sinatra. Do you know if Sammy Davis Jr. had a signature? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know if uh, Sammy Davis Jr. had a signature drink. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Um, but I will, I will look into that. I'll check it out. All right, that's it. Thank you. Please like and subscribe. We're going to do this again, um, and hopefully it'll get better each time we do it. So come back and have a drink with me next time at uh, Barrel.